Salam and hello everyone. My name is Nurul Izzah Anwar. And today I want to tell you a story uh, about uh, a decades old enemy, how he became my Valentine's. Um, anyway, on August 10th of 1998, when I was still 17, slightly older than Sadiq, <laughs> I penned my father his 59th birthday letter. And I ended it with words that hearken the expression, uh, be careful uh, with what you wish for. In the closing of that birthday letter, because what do you really buy for the Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia? I wrote to Anwar Ibrahim, this veteran political activist, Papa, I've never had to fight for anything other than good grades and basically rewards for my good behavior all my achievements and everything else. Tell me, how was it like for you when you were busy demonstrating to fight poverty for the four farmers in Baling? Tell me how it felt like. Tell me if life could mean more than just studying. So by 20th of September 1998, I basically got my answer. And Anwar Ibrahim sacking as Deputy Prime Minister weeks earlier by Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad led to one of the biggest protest rallies in the country. But what's more important, it was my first rally. Um, I've never had attended any demonstration before. And let me tell you this, hundreds of thousands of people in one particular setting, it was just phenomenal. And of course, they were demanding Mahathir's resignation and they called for reforms in a country they felt that was dominated and controlled by one man. So it was exciting, an exciting day. I was, you know, with my checkered shirt, um, you know, all unassuming, felt very encouraged. But later that night, our lives changed forever. So that very same night, you had armed commandos who broke into our home, pointed machine guns at my siblings, including many others, and arrested my father, where they dragged him well, you know, in front of all of us, and they handcuffed and they blindfolded him. And I felt, I remember the feeling of being so powerless. And that was the most powerless moment in my life. And I, I remember not wanting to feel that way ever again. And after he disappeared that night, um, we found out later he was beaten, still blindfolded and handcuffed by the chief of police of Malaysia. And he was left untreated and conscious for days. So, but, you know, what's important is it wasn't just my family, there was scores of others presidents of non-governmental organizations who pledged support and sympathy for Anwar Ibrahim and the reform movement, they were all detained. So you, know, you had family members who felt so angry. They blamed one person who was responsible for taking away their loved ones. So for me, for more than a week, we could not see him. We didn't know where he was. And then we started just basically writing letters. At the time, in 1998, the fax machine was the bomb. No one emailed anybody. People just faxed letters. So that's what we did. We faxed the police station, bombarding them with requests, demands to see our father. And finally, one day, Hannah, my younger sister, she was six at the time, she fell ill. And during her illness, she also decided to scribble a note to Musa Hassan the then investigating officer. And she wrote in that note, very simply, Tuan, Hana demam, Hana nak jumpa papa. And she placed her tiny thumbprint. And believe it or not, within 24 hours, we did get to see our father. And uh, it was very difficult and painful to see him because he was so frail, he was beaten, but he still had the same smile and that still strong spirit. And, you know, just to, sh to share with you, 
I mean, Hannah's scroll, Hannah's thumbprint. If a six-year-old could manage to exact change, I mean, that was the moment I felt no one was powerless. So my father's imprisonment was the ultimate crisis in my life. It's a good uh, crisis because as you know in life, you're never going to be devoid of any problems. But in hindsight, it was also the fate that brought about greater heights of maturity and a very steep learning curve that was very valuable for me. So I had to take off a year from my studies, which is very difficult. Uh, unlike most of you, I actually loved university life. <laughs> and at 18, I was a real nerd. Uh, at 18, I, became, I began this nationwide and, and sort of uh, worldwide tour, along with many others, to meet with concerned activists and Malaysians everywhere to seek support, not just for the release of my father and other political prisoners, but to promote the reform agenda. And, you know, for me, it was very important because if the second most powerful man in the country could be treated so unjustly, imagine the average person in Malaysia, imagine the Penan from Gua Musang. Imagine the Orang Aslis from Sarawak. Imagine the refugees, some of whom I met in the police lockups and all detained in detention centres throughout Malaysia. I mean, imagine their fate. So I eventually was able to continue my studies at Uni 10. But I wanted to tell you, I was uh, actually denied from International Islamic University. The university my father founded and funded and the reason was I was too politically toxic to be allowed in. So it was good because you can empathize with the plight of many others. And of course, I shied away from a formal political role for myself for as long as I could. I took up engineering. And by 2008, uh, scores of my comrades who decided to contest in that particular elections, and they asked me to join along, and I thought, you know, if I didn't do this, and if I just joined Shell or any other multinational companies, I might live to regret that decision. I had to be part of such a pivotal moment, win or lose. I mean, it was such an important moment for democracy requires Democrats, and reform requires reformists. So in 2008, I joined my colleagues, and the extremely supportive people of Lembah Pantai ushered me into the Day One Rakyat. I remember Safia was just born, uh, my first child. And, um, you know, of course you had an extended family as member of parliament. But it was just really wonderful. You know, it, it was really a sense of empowerment because people entrusted you with such an important role to be their representative in the parliament. So why did I do so? You know, I was driven because I didn't want to just be a passive follower. I wanted to be an active participant. This is what my country and the future is supposed to be what I partake and decide to do with it. And somewhere along the way, I wanted to right the wrongs that's been committed. But more importantly, how else would I prove? I wasn't just Anwar's daughter. I cared a lot about the realization of reforms. It wasn't just about Anwar's freedom that would make me feel that's enough, let's go back to life. Let's go back to the normalcy of being an engineer in a multinational company. But life is really what we experience day to day, not this idea of perfection that we think we deserve one way or the other. I wanted Malaysia to accord equal opportunities to all its citizens. I wanted the rule of, of law to thrive. I wanted multiracialism to be our binding force, and I wanted to see an end to racial and religious politics. And of course, I wanted the media to be the vanguard to voice out against any excesses. But I think, you know, most of all, I wanted Safia and Harith, my children, to grow up in a country that will celebrate their talents, not based on who they know or who they didn't know, but really having that equal opportunity to thrive and succeed. And the system it meant which has unearthed all these experiences against me, my comrades and many other Malaysians, 
it would seem failed all of us and also failed to Dr. Mahathir Muhammad who came to realize it by 2015. So can you imagine after all those years? By September 2016, something huge happened. As Bernie Sanders would put it, huge, right? <laughs> this former Prime Minister who reigned over Malaysia for 22 years decided to bring himself to court to support Anwar, my father. The man he imprisoned 18 years earlier in Anwar's suit against the government's new national security laws, which we considered draconian. I arrived to court a little late that day, but the big news that shook everyone uh, was the handshake that took place between the two, who had not met each other for 18 long years. So I entered the, the witness room uh, where they sat together and I saw a hunched over 92-year-old man looking pensively, almost gently. I could not bring myself to shake his hands yet. It was so overwhelming, eh, the, the emotions. But I felt sad. I remember feeling sad. If my grandfather was alive, he would be the same age as Tun Mahathir. You know, and having that resolve to come to court, pledging principal support against this extreme law, I mean, the activists in me, you know, had to applaud that. Um, you know, I, I find myself, you know, I was caught not to hate the individual person. And I don't hate him, I felt sad. I felt sad that all these years have passed on, gone by with so much hurt and pain. And I also wanted us to focus on the actions against fighting injustice. So I told myself then, I'm going to be ready to observe his actions. I'm going to support them if they were aligned with my principles. And I think when I finally came home that night, you know, initially you felt very angry, you, you know, so many emotions. But I felt this hatred for Mahathir that I had kept for so long, against his actions, of course, but still, there's a lot of bitterness, was directed at this person who may have, perhaps have had his own epiphany. Was I ready to change myself as well? You know, forgiveness is a funny thing. When you forgive others, you eventually forgive the most bitter part of yourself. And you learn to move on, because people like to move and walk with a huge chip on your shoulder, and you can't walk straight that way. You need to be able to let go of your ghosts. So that handshake was an important stepping stone for a united nation, long divided by painful strife. We needed to mend, we needed to heal, really. I needed to heal. And we needed reforms. And I'm proud to say that I believed in unity based on principle. And a proven public commitment to change, then only is it justified to let those who hurt us in the past, even in seemingly helping us to do good for others. So I started two paths with that handshake. The first, in engaging Tun Mahathir and his team, clarifying the issue of reformacy that were essential, crucial for my side, before we could have a united collaboration. And the second was reflecting on the wisdom to do what was best for our nation above my personal angst. And you know, I believe that we should forgive those who commit to change and want to join with good, but believing that in your mind and feeling it in your heart and then putting it into practice are very different things. So five months after the handshake, I found myself face to face sharing the stage with Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad on the 14th of February this year. And after months and months of back channel negotiations to confirm his real change and my own months of self introspection, I invited him for my fundraising dinner. And uh, because for me, Tun Mahathir was open to joining Unity for Principle, and because I had also succeeded overcoming my own pain and anger to focus on what was necessary for justice to prevail. And so the dinner, for your benefit, was held on the 14th of February, and I didn't have the chance to seek Jawi's approval, uh, but I referred it as Valentine's Day for your benefit. 
not mine. Um, but it just became so important because both of us didn't really have private dates. He brought his date along. And you know, it was such a meaningful date, I guess. And later when I met Tun Mahathir during Ramadan, uh, it was my first time sitting in his living room, we agreed that we were going to work towards a future. And there you have it. I can't mention the particular name here, but the issue is unity based on principles. So my message today for all of you, in all that you face, all the challenges that you may have to uh, overcome, is about the imperative for action and the power of forgiveness. We are all empowered one way or the other, and it's imperative that we take action in whatever we can to improve the situation in our lives and, of course, the community around us. If the letter of a six-year-old could prove useful in securing a family visit to visit their political prisoner of a father, imagine what you can do. You brains out here today. If a retired ophthalmologist and an 18-year-old together with a group of non-political stakeholders can power an entire reform movement, imagine what thousands of Malaysian university students can do if they get engaged. And if I could confront my deepest fears, regret and sadness to forgive and engage with a former dictator after he has decided to embrace reforms, imagine what Malaysia can be. We can really, truly overcome anything. Now, I think it's very important to understand that we have to continuously stay involved and we have to always walk with a straight path without any chips on our shoulders. You might be wanting to contribute to your university. You might be wanting to contribute to a non-governmental organization. You might be wanting to stand for elections. But <laughs> what's important here, focus, darlings. What's important here is really, you have to do it with a clear conscience and you can't do it with a hang up. Whatever has happened to you in the past, when you're offering yourself, you can't offer it with the ghost of your past hanging over you. It's about moving forward. It's about building and powering the future. Life is very beautiful every second that you live it. And I always thought being an engineer was far better, but heck no. <laughs> heck no, I mean, heck no. So for me, you know, I've met so many people, learned from the best. And my best moment, I tell you, was when I was actually detained beside two and four year old Vietnamese refugees. Because I've seen how these kids can survive and smile and laugh in their lockup cell. And I told myself, I would not trade that moment and experience for just working in a multinational company. Not that it's not good, it's good, lah, it's good, it's very, very, very useful, you see, the money is good. <laughs> but allow me to end by saying, my dearest students and my dearest colleagues and comrades, if I could finish my presentation and sharing session with you today with one thought, just let it be. Be empowered, take action, please make Malaysia your Valentine's. Thank you. Ooh.